Hi guys, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the synapse. It's important that when we think about the synapse, we remember the goal of the cell. The important thing is to remember that when we're looking at a human, we're zooming into a neuron and where the neuron is connected to the muscle. So let's do an example here. First I'll draw a person, we'll figure out where we're going, and then I'll zoom in and we'll talk about the biochemical processes. From there, we'll do a review of every single step like we're telling a story, and then we'll do an overall review of every single part. Let's say this person is thinking of an action. This could be any action, but let's say this person wants to do a squat. So this person is going to be thinking, okay, I want to do a squat. But the problem is, the message right now is in the person's brain. And in order to do a squat, we need to activate muscles such as the quadriceps. So the problem is, how can we go from the brain into the quadriceps muscle? How can we get a message to be sent up from the cranial cavity into the muscle that's all the way down in the legs? The answer to that is the nervous system. We do this through a pathway of neurons. So to simplify it, I'm going to draw a neuron that is connected from the brain into the quadriceps. This blue is a neuron. The end of the neuron is called an axon. Again, message in the brain is being sent down a neuron to the end of a neuron, which is called an axon, and then we are going to the muscle. From now on, from this moment forwards, we're going to be zooming in into this square that I'm highlighting here. We will be looking at the axon terminal, which is the edge of an axon, as well as the muscle that it's going to innervate. I'm going to erase this person so we have some room to write down each of the steps that we go through. The important thing to note here is that this message has already come from the brain, which is all the way up in the ceiling, traveled down a neuron, and we've now reached the axon terminal. I'll label it axon. And this here is the muscle. In our case, it's the quadriceps, which is a muscle in the thigh. Let's do a little bit more labeling. The membrane of a muscle cell is called the sarcolemma. And the prefix sarco comes from the Latin word flesh. It's very important to note here that the axon and the muscle cell are not touching. If this were the axon and my palm is the muscle, they're not touching directly. There's a gap between the two parts. And this gap here, the empty space, is known as the synaptic cleft. Another bit of terminology here is that this divot in the muscle cell is known as a T-tubule. And because it looks like a T. Also within the muscle cell, we will find organelles. Just like a cell would have an endoplasmic reticulum, a muscle cell will have a sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is analogous to the endoplasmic reticulum and it's often abbreviated into SR. From here, we know that the message has now traveled all the way down the neuron and it's reached the axon terminal. The form that the message is in is in a neurotransmitter. This neurotransmitter is called acetylcholine, abbreviated ACH, and it's transported in these bubbles called vesicles. Vesicles are the mode of transport for these neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitter that we're looking at in this example, and in most examples that you'll see, is acetylcholine. Again, I've abbreviated it ACH, and I'll be using ACH from now on. Since we're looking at the synapse, I'll title it synapse here, and we'll continue with our steps for the events that occur. So event number one is the vesicles arrive at the axon. The vesicles are full of acetylcholine and they're just waiting to be released. But you can think of it as people waiting to cross the street. There's an intersection here and people are just waiting and waiting and waiting to cross the street. 
So they've all accumulated and they're waiting for the light to change, but they can't cross the street until they get the signal, which is a green light. And in this case, we don't actually have any traffic lights involved, but we have another signal in the form of a signaling molecule called calcium. We have calcium ions floating outside the axon. Plenty of calcium ions. The problem is, calcium needs a channel to come into the axon. As soon as calcium enters the axon, the vesicles know, all right, it's time to go, just like pedestrians know, all right, it's time, the light has changed, we can go. So you can think of calcium as a green light. As soon as calcium comes into the axon, the vesicles know that it is now their time to perform a process called exocytosis. But let's backtrack a little bit. Step two, calcium enters axon via calcium channels. The important thing is calcium is now, and I'll write it in red, signal. Calcium is playing the role of a signal for the vesicles to know that it is now their time to perform exocytosis. Exocytosis means that the vesicles are leaving the cell. It doesn't look like a cell, but we have to remember that the axon is part of a nerve, a neuron, which is a cell. Even though the neuron doesn't look like a normal cell, it performs all the functions of a normal cell. It has a nucleus, it can do exocytosis, which it will in this case. When the vesicles perform exocytosis, the acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. These Y-shaped structures are called acetylcholine receptors. There are many, many acetylcholine receptors along the sarcolemma. Now we've done the exocytosis and plenty of acetylcholine is entering the synaptic cleft. They arrive in the acetylcholine receptors. From there, the acetylcholine remains within the receptor while the signal travels down the T-tubule. These jagged lines that I drew represent a signal. You can think of it this way. Say I have a bunch of chocolates, and I have a lot of chocolates that I want to give to my friend, and I also want my friend to say hello to another friend. So I give my chocolates to one friend, and I say, all right, tell friend number two that I say hello. The chocolate stays with the first friend, but the message continues on. Similar to this case, the acetylcholine remains in the receptor while the signal travels down the T-tubule. Soon as it goes down the T-tubule, it's connected to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Step number five, signal travels down T-tubule. The signal progresses down the T-tubule until it reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum. From here, we'll have to pause again, and I have to tell you something really cool that's inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's more calcium. There's more calcium within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it plays a very important role, again, as a signaling molecule. Key here, calcium is a signaling molecule. Again, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is flooded with calcium, and they want to go from a high concentration of calcium to a low concentration of calcium. This is the process of diffusion. We need some calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once the signal hits the SR, calcium can leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium leaves the sarcoplasmic reticulum through calcium channels. Where does the calcium go? Our goal is to move the muscle. And we've already gone from the neuron into the muscle, but what is the part of a muscle that allows the contraction to occur? It's the actin and the myosin, so let's draw some of those thick and thin filaments in. We have actin and myosin. Myosin is a protein that makes up the thick filament, and actin is a component of the thin filament. Also on the thin filament, you'll find two other proteins with pretty long and confusing names, but they are called troponin and tropomyosin. I'll label them over here. 
Let's go over this structure one more time. We have the thick filament, which is made up of myosin. On the thin filament, there's actually three proteins. Three proteins make up the thin filament. And the three proteins are mainly actin, which is the contractile protein. Actin's doing all the work. But we have troponin and tropomyosin there as regulatory molecules. You can think of them as assistants. They're there to help out. And the three of these together make up a team called the thin filament. It's important to note that actin is not the only protein in a thin filament because we also have troponin and tropomycin. Another cool thing is you can note that things that end with in are proteins. So troponin, actin, myosin, and tropomycin are all proteins. Okay, back to the story. So calcium has just left the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium is now in the muscle cell and it binds to troponin. As soon as calcium binds to troponin, troponin leaves the actin. As soon as troponin leaves the actin, it leaves an empty spot for the myosin to bind. You can think of it this way. I wish I had more people in here so that we could really act it out and I could really show you guys, but I'm just here by myself, so I can't. You can think of it as, I just dragged a chair over. I don't know if you can see it, but you can think of, I'm sitting in this chair. If I'm sitting in this chair, then I have the binding spot. It's all mine. But if I receive the calcium and I hold on to the calcium, I'm troponin, and I leave, this spot is now available for someone else to take, and that would be the myosin. So I'll explain that one more time. I am troponin. I'm troponin and I'm sitting on the actin. The chair is actin. As soon as calcium comes in and I take the calcium, I step aside and the chair becomes available for something else to bind to it. Again, the calcium comes and moves troponin. Once troponin leaves, the actin now has an empty spot right here. There's an empty spot for something else to bind. And the thing that's going to bind is actually the head of the myosin, which normally looks like a tadpole-ish thing. So troponin leaves the actin exposing a binding site. The binding site is now available for myosin to grab. So myosin head grabs actin. It's critical to remember here that the myosin itself is not moving. However, the myosin head is. You can think of it as, I am standing here and I am not moving, but I can reach my hand out, grab something, and pull it. I can bring my hand back up, grab something, and pull it. While I myself am not moving, my, head, my hand is. And in this case, the myosin itself isn't moving, but it's using its heads, myosin heads, to grab the actin and pull the actin towards it. The myosin head holds on to the place that the troponin once was, grabs the actin, and will pull. What happens when myosin pulls on actin is the filaments are drawn closer together according to the sliding filament theory. This causes the actin to be brought closer and closer to the myosin, and our muscle is able to contract. Remember, in this position, my bicep is long and elongated. As soon as the myosin draws the actin towards it, forming a contraction, my muscle shortens. And that's exactly what we want. So the myosin pulls on the actin, the sarcomeres become closer and closer together, and a contraction is generated. This was in the quadriceps, so our person can finally run after 10 very long steps. Let's do a big recap of all the concepts. The brain is sending a message. Okay, I want to run. The message needs to travel all the way down to the quadricep, and it does this thanks to the nervous system. The nervous system has neurons. The message travels all the way down the neuron, and we reach an axon. The vesicles full of neurotransmitters are sitting in the axon, and they're waiting for a go signal. The go signal finally comes, 
and it's in the form of a calcium ion, or many calcium ions. The calcium ions flood from high concentration into an area of low concentration via the calcium channels. As soon as calcium floods into the axon, the vesicles can perform exocytosis. Exocytosis is the process in which the vesicles press up against the membrane of the neuron, which is also a cell, releasing its contents into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine now floods the synaptic cleft and they arrive in acetylcholine specific receptors. As soon as the signal is transmitted down the T-tubule, which is still an extension of the sarcolemma, calcium can leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum via the calcium channels. Again, it's moving from an area of high concentration into the sarcoplasm, which has an area of low concentration. Calcium binds to a protein called troponin. Troponin is part of the thin filament, along with tropomyosin and actin. Troponin will leave the actin, exposing a place for the myosin heads to grab. The myosin heads will bind to the place that troponin was, and it will pull the actin towards it, like so. Pulling the actin towards it. When myosin pulls the actin towards it, the muscle will contract as the filaments slide closer and closer together. The length of the filaments themselves are not changing, but rather they are sliding towards each other, causing a contraction to be formed. And that is really it for the story of our synapse, remembering that there are three parts of the thin filament, but the parts responsible for a contraction are the actin and the myosin. Troponin and tropomyosin are simply playing a role in supporting the regulation of actin and myosin as they slide towards each other.